Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Jared W., at J Foster TM, Brent S, and Nick O. Rick Clark is our new guest on the show today. Rick is CEO and Director of Orca Gold, a Sudan-focused gold project development company advancing the Block 14 gold project in North Sudan. The company is listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol ORG and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol CAN. WF. Mr. Rick Clark, it's a pleasure. How are you doing, sir? Very good. Thank you, Andrew, for inviting me. Well, Rick, your thoughts on the gold market here. Uh, what stage do you think we are in and what do you expect to accomplish uh, during this upswing in the market? Wow, that's such a loaded question. You know, all throughout my career, people have asked me what I think about the gold market and uh, and, and current conditions. And I can tell you that is such a moving target for everybody because there's so many factors that that apply uh, depending upon what's going on in the world, both from a stability slash instability level all the way through to um, you know uh, things like the the U.S. presidential elections and 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 let's face it, weather events, COVID, everything. Looking at it today, look, I think we're in a unique position. I think that. Um, people are trying to understand exactly what's going to what's going on with world economies. They're trying to understand what's going on with world currencies, um, particularly how strong is the U.S. dollar going to be? What's going to happen now that Biden is elected, quote unquote? Uh, what's that going to do to the U.S. markets? And everyone looks at all those factors and says, "Do I need security? Do do I need to go to something that has been historically over millennia?" Um, secure and and really one of the principal forces of of exchange and that is gold. So I look at I look at what's gone on particularly this year 2020. I look at COVID. I look at the the U.S. elections. I look at other elections in the world. I look at the fact that you know the various central banks and um, the equivalent of the U.S. Fed have worked on stimulus packages that have effectively turned on printing presses full steam. Um, huge, huge amounts of currencies have been printed uh, in order to, in particular, handle the, the COVID situation. Um, even with even with the discovery of a vaccine and the application of a vaccine worldwide, let's assume that takes us uh, you know, through 2021, you're still going to be left with this huge economic overhang of uh, currencies and the markets. And I think that gold has an, an amazing path over the next couple of years as the world tries to get their head around exactly what has happened as a result of COVID from an economic perspective. So am I bullish on gold? Yes, I'm bullish on gold. Am I a gold bug? Uh, I, I'd say no in the sense that I look at all sorts of factors and I, I really focus on you know, world events and how that is affecting uh, people's perception of security. And that's where I think we are. Do I think gold's going to $5,000? You know, that'd be great. I don't think so. Do I think it's going to 2,500? Yeah, I think it's got a real chance of 2,500 going through 2021. So that's my view on gold, Andrew. Very well, and certainly the folks have always said recently, you know, why hasn't gold gone up faster? And I just say, give it some time and have some patience because uh, anybody who's in the sector, whether you're a resource executive, a mining company, uh, everybody's got some serious patience if you're in this sector. If you look at uh, past gold prices and the upswings, the cycles of the gold price, we've always seen that gold's at least doubled its previous high. That would put us on expectation that we're certainly headed higher over a number of years. Well, talk about the mineral extraction business, Rick, in general here. What key problems do you see at this stage in the market and what things need to change? I think there's, there's two different um, issues in that regard. And one is base metals and the other is precious metals. On the base metals, and I'll just touch upon that very quickly because I'm a precious metals guy. 
but on the base metal side, it, 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 look, it is really supply and demand. In other words, if the world economies are strong and we're seeing lots of construction, um, you see, you know, big swings, mostly upward in base metal prices. Um, the same with, same with oil. When world economies are sluggish, when they are, when they are skittish, uh, when they're nervous, uh, we see demand go down, we see construction go down, we see consumption go down, and we face, you know, softness in the base metal side. On the precious metal side, um, it's, it's a little bit different in that, uh, particularly with gold, and as we touched upon, the gold price has lots of things that affect it. And I, I think I, I'd refer you back to my previous answer. But the one thing in terms of commodities themselves is that it is becoming more and more and more difficult to find economic gold projects. And so consequently, we are seeing uh, some response in gold price to that fact, but I would say it's minimal compared to world economic factors. I don't think the general public really understands what's happening with gold production. It is going down. And the types of mines that are being produced, like the quality of mines to a certain degree are going down as well. And what happens with a rising gold price is suddenly projects that have been around for years, decades, suddenly people are going, those are great projects. Well, guess what? They're not really great projects. They're just now being reflected by an increased price of gold. So I think what we're looking at is going forward is a declining uh, production profile for the next few years because there's not a lot of mines, new mines coming on stream. There's not a lot of, of discoveries. There's hardly any discoveries of, of economic significance. And what we're getting is major mining companies, producers, all doing brownfields, all doing cost analysis and trying to produce gold at a lower cost and try to find more resource slash reserves around existing mines. But certainly the broad scope of exploration success, development success, that's not in this cycle to any significant degree right at the moment. Yeah, excellent. Certainly agreed. Well, let's go back for a sec. Let's talk about why you got into this business, Rick, and just cover your background pre-Redback. Then mm -hmm. I want to get into Redback specifically. Look, originally, I got, I, it's funny, I got into geology because my, my uncle was a, a geologist. And uh, when I was a kid, he would give me uh, mineral samples for, for Christmas. And that really, and then when we got together for, you know, family events, I talked to him about, you know, exploration geology. He was a primarily an exploration geologist. When I was 17 years old, with his assistance, I got my first job in exploration, working as a soil sampler and a grunt in an exploration camp in Northern British Columbia. And that really got me interested um, in the business of uh, geology. And I proceeded to do a double double major in university, but really strange one, geology and political science. And all through my university career, uh, undergrad career, I worked as a geologist in the, in the summertime. And then when I decided uh, to go to grad school, I looked at this and said, look, I, at those days, it wasn't the greatest lifestyle to be a geologist. You were away, literally away from your families for you know up to six months, if not more. And the way that the business worked in those days. And I looked at that and, and I went, no, that's not for me. I need to do something that combines uh, what my love of geology and exploration and my other skills and go forward and, and basically be able to try to make a lot of money, but, but stay in town. And so, you know, I did what so many people do when they don't know really what they want to do. I went to law school. After law school, I became a resource lawyer and I, uh, my practice was, you know, pretty much mining companies uh, at all sorts of different levels, both in terms of junior exploration, producers, financings, everything. But for my seven-year career um, as a mining lawyer, uh, all my clients were, were focused on the industry. In 1993, I made the decision to leave law. Uh, I didn't really like the business of law. I, I wanted to be more of an entrepreneur. And I joined a client of mine who is still to, to this day a very, very good friend, very close friend of mine, a guy by the name of Simon Ridgway, who many of your listeners will know. And Simon is probably one of the most well-known 
uh, generative exploration um, guys in the business, uh, primarily focused in most of his career in Latin America. And Simon and I created a company called Tombstone Explorations, and we ran that company and created another company called Mar West. Uh, Mar West found a mine in Honduras. Uh, we sold to Galanis. Tombstone found a couple of projects that became mines, but the Venezuelan government took them away from us. And after that experience and after Mar West, I decided that what I'd really like to do is to go into the development, mine development production side of the, uh, the business. And I was lucky enough to join up with a guy by the name of Adolf Lundin. And this is over 20 years ago. And I didn't know Lucas Lundin at that time. I knew his dad. And uh, his dad convinced me to join the group. And here we are, plus 20 years later, um, still, still connected to the Lundin group. Um, our major shareholders are still connected to the Lundin group. And I made the decision along with um, Lucas's father that we would focus in Africa. And I've been doing that uh, ever since. Excellent. Pretty expansive background across the board. I like the mineral samples for Christmas, uh, the political science study. I think in the work that you're doing, I think that's also a critical point to understand foreign policy and how to deal with those types of aspects, because I think the mining business has every bit of that now and more. But yeah, fantastic experience, Rick. Well, let's go back and talk about Redback Mining, um, a company you sold to Ken Ross in 2010 for about $7 billion Canadian. Impeccable timing, by the way. Redback still makes up the productive assets of Ken Ross in Africa that they still own today. Talk about the success you had with Redback. Okay. Uh, well, Redback, it was we decided in the group, um, it basically Lucas's father and I, that we would go into gold in Africa, in West Africa. We discovered a project, we had a shell company, we discovered a project, an Australian junior that had taken it to a, uh, you know, an early feasibility level of project in Ghana. And we may, we were able to do a deal um, with the Australian company. It was named Redback. And we effectively bought that company, merged it with our shell, changed the name of the shell to Redback Mining Inc. and, and listed in Toronto, Vancouver, and proceeded to, to raise the money to complete the study and, and construct the mine. The market cap of Redback, the Canadian company at the time we did that, was about you know, 40 million, 50 million uh, Canadian dollars. The biggest financiers of that were the Lundin family and management and some selected investors in and, and first round. And we then proceeded to uh, go out and raise the money, the debt and equity to build Chorano in the first instance. And that was with the assistance of Macquarie Bank on the debt side in Australia. And you got to remember when we did this deal, gold was trading under 300 bucks an ounce. When we did the first financing, uh, the significant debt financing, we hedged some gold at 400, I think it was about 400 and change an ounce. And Macquarie came to us and went, congratulations, that's the highest hedge book we've ever given. And, and I was like, you know, I hated doing it because I thought gold was going up, but that's part of the game. We needed to finance the mine and away we went. Look, we ended up being in the right place at the right time. We got Toronto going. We did more exploration, made a huge discovery um, on an underground deposit. We were able to expand that mine. Gold price was going up. We were able to use our success and our projected cash flow to then go out and look at other assets. And the first one we made a big push on was an asset called Kibali in the DRC. And that is now a project that's owned by Barrick and Anglo. We were in the running there. We almost got that project, but in the end got outbid. Uh, we had a very, very large break fee that was paid to us. And we then uh, quickly were able to capitalize on another asset we were looking at called Tassiest uh, in the country of Mauritania. And we went into Tassiest, that project had, well, let me backtrack. When we did Toronto, it had a reserve of about, mineable reserve of about 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 million ounces. Okay, with a mine life of eight years. Just to touch on that, we put that mine in production in about 2004, okay? 
So here we are in 2020 and the mine's still going. So that's a, you know, pretty, that's what happens with mines. Um, once you get these things going, your chances of making them bigger and better are very good. And that's what we capitalized on. You go to Tassiest, uh, again, it was a project of about 1.1, 1.2 million ounces. And it was going to produce about 120, 130,000 ounces a year. And we went in there, we thought, there was a very quick potential to add half a million ounces to the to the existing footprint. That was the reason we bought the mine. We very quickly proved that up and we proved that half a million ounces and we patted ourselves on the back and said, look, great success, away we go, but let's go and explore some more. In that exploration process, we discovered something called the green schist zone that ended up making Tassius one of the biggest deposits in Africa. And that is the reason we were able to entice the majors like Kinron's to come in and have a look. In actual fact, after a lot of back and forth and a lot of players, we did sell the project to Kinross in 2010. And it was actually 7 billion US dollars, uh, about 9 billion Canadian. And you know, we sold it, don't get me wrong, we sold it at almost the top of the market in, in the top of the gold price. But that's what our shareholders expect of us. And that's what we did. Many people looked at us and said, oh, you destroyed Kinross in later years because what they paid for that asset. But, you know, I'd like to point out, as you said, Andrew, those two assets are the basis of Kinross's African um, operation. And in fact, Tassiest is probably 40 plus percent of the NPV of, of Kinross. So it is now being upgraded. It is going to produce, I don't know, somewhere between six and 800,000 ounces a year. It's an absolutely spectacular project, and it's a cornerstone asset for Kinross today. So that is what we do. We, we go out and we take political risk as a group. We will assess the political risk ourselves. We don't listen to too many other people. We don't take personal security risk, um, but we will take political risk. And that's what we did in Ghana. We did it in Mauritania and now we're doing it in Sudan. And we do it because we think we can find big, big projects that will be world, world scale. And our track record in that regard, whether it's Africa, whether it's Argentina, whether it's Ecuador and Chile, you know, on the gold side, I'm only talking about, that's the basis of the success of the Lundin Group. And um, we're looking to absolutely duplicate that again with uh, Sudan. You know, well executed across the board there. When we came into the bear market, you know, starting 2012 or, you know, somewhere around there, there was a lot of assets that changed hands in 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. 2016. Of course, there was destruction across the board, across the sector. And, you know, that's that's how it goes. And we're going to see it again, Rick. We're going to see that rise in gold price. We're going to see uh, prices that uh, could become unbelievable or, or just way higher than we imagined. And that's going to happen again, and that's just how it goes. That's just the nature of, I think, of the the sector, and of course, the economics of it as well. As as money starts sloshing around, I appreciate you going through the details of Redback. So after Redback came Orca Gold through Canico, 2012, if I'm not mistaken. And sorry, it's seven billion US for Redback. What what attracted you to Sedan? Take us over your thought process post Redback. What were you thinking? You, you know, obviously you're on Ken Ross board for a short period of time and then you left, of course. But what was the thought process and what really attracted you to Sudan? Well, we had operations at the time, Andrew, in Eritrea. Um, we liked the Nubian Shield. After Redback, we went to Hugh Stewart, who, you know, has been with me from, uh, you know, for, for 15 years. And Hugh is the one that directs us to where we go to look for gold. Um, he's one of the most successful gold finders today, I think, in the world, uh, certainly in Africa. And he's been a huge asset um, for the Lundin Group. And Hugh, Hugh came and said to us, look, if we're looking for underexplored, if not you know, zero explored areas in Africa that have huge potential, then we need to look geologically at the Nubian Shield, in particular, Sudan. And we need to go in there and understand that there's gonna be very, practically no, if any, data. And we're gonna to have to generate it ourselves. We're gonna to have to make a commitment. We're gonna to have to do it from square one. 
but that was his view of where we could find it, um, you know, in a relatively short period of time, a gold, large, large gold asset. We weren't bothered by Sudan, and I'll tell you why. Lucas and the, his family had been operating in Sudan for a number of years back in the oil days. I actually first went to Sudan in 1981. I did a trip from, uh, overland trip from Nairobi to Cairo, um, through all of Sudan. So we knew, knew the area, we knew what the people were like. Um, the key thing for us was, was you know, we, di we didn't believe we'd have any personal security issues. We believed the problem with Sudan was perception at that point rather than reality. We looked at the politics, we saw the politics improving, and that was primarily because of sanctions. The US sanctions, the world sanctions took a long time to affect Sudan, but they eventually did, forcing the then administration under uh, Omar Bashir to have to start uh, basically bending to the Western world, otherwise these sanctions were gonna destroy the country. And so we saw that movement. We, we saw Sudan about to be, it was poised to go from uh, split the country into South Sudan and Sudan. We were only interested in the North and that's what we did. So we went into Sudan on that basis. We knew we had to establish a beachhead. We started an office in Khartoum. We started exploration and we heard about a gold rush that was going on in the north near the Egyptian border that nobody knew about. So we sent people up there and it was staggering. Tens of thousands of artisanal miners mining the surface, mining remnant gold on, in the desert. And we then realized, discovered there was a number of government granted concessions to local businessmen. We went around, we had a look and we, did, we found it a uh, concession we liked called Block 14. We did a deal with the owner, and then we proceeded to uh, do exploration. And in very, very quick order, uh, we identified a drill target, and the first drill hole we put in was the discovery hole. And fast forward, you know, five years later, um, we delivered a feasibility study to the government of Sudan to put the project in, into production, and that was back in 2018. That, that's the story of where we got to and and you know the other part of the story is politics but i'll leave you to ask, ask that question but certainly we in a very short period of time in terms of our business we took a project with no data and came up with a feasibility study in uh, 2018. let's get into the details on that here in a moment first let's let's just do a high level overview rick uh, for the audience uh, into Orca, just talk about the current share structure at this point and the list of major backers to the company. Sure, there's approximately right now about 225 million shares out in, in Orca. Um, I think it's important for your listeners to understand how we did this. The normal avenues that we would have gone to as a group in terms of financing a project like this or, or a company like this would have been going to you know institutional um, subscribers that we, we've been, you know, associated with for a long period of time. That was not available for Orca because of the U.S. sanctions on Sudan. So we really, to this point in time, Andrew, we have no significant institutional shareholders in Orca. We took a cash-rich shell called Canico, and, and we used that money to get established and start the process of exploration. Any other financings we've done since then have all been done predominantly with our principal shareholders and insiders. Okay, so none of the normal uh, avenues. And so Orca now, as I said, is sitting with about 225 million shares out, $8 million in, in the bank. And the significant shareholdings are the Lundin Group. They own about 17%. Resolute Mining, the Australian gold mining company that did a private placement in us in a few years a few years ago, uh, and they've maintained and increased their interest. I should point out, um, they have about 16%. Ross Beatty, uh, who everybody knows, a uh, very very good friend of of the groups and mine personally, has backed us on this venture, and Ross is there for almost 11%. And then management and the you know the insiders management. In that regard, we're about seven eight percent. So 
you know, a very tightly held company with key people in the mining business. And uh, the reason they're in the company is the potential of, of Block 14. And they're all guys that take risk. And they're all guys that have been in projects where politics have been iffy upon occasion. Um, but we all make that decision based on the potential of the project. And, and that certainly has paid off for us in, in Sudan. And talk about uh, some of the other management members and directors, Rick. Most of them are red, have some connection with Redback, Andrew. Certainly, well, obviously me, uh, Hugh Stewart. We're going to be doing some adjusting on the corporate profile of Orca because Hugh is now primarily focused on Montage, our, our subsidiary, and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to that. Um, Glenn Kondo is CFO. Glenn was the CFO of Lucera, part of the Lundin Group. Um, we, you know, Kevin Ross is chief operating officer. Kevin was my chief operating officer at Redback and uh, was responsible for the operations in, in Ghana and in uh, Mauritania. And then, you know, behind these guys, there's, there's a raft of, of Redback support group um, all the way from previous staff uh, all, and, and consultants that we've used over the years, including, you know, uh, the engineering company like a podium who has done most of our engineering work, um, at least for, for my part, the Redback part and the Orca part uh, to now. In terms of the board, uh, again, the board is, it's, it's an interesting board. It's myself, it's Hugh Stewart, it's Bob Chase. Bob has been uh, with us for in the group for many, many, many years and Bob's an accountant and uh, he's the, the chair of the audit committee. Uh, Derek White, everybody, will, no Derek. Uh, Derek's been around a long time, has a great reputation in Canada and uh, is doing his own thing but um, uh, kindly agreed to come on the Orca board uh, to pro provide his operational expertise to the board. David Field is on the board. Uh, David is Australian. David was the principal uh, natural resource fund manager for Carmignac in Paris back in the last gold cycle. Uh, that's how I met David. We became very, very good friends. Um, Carmignac, uh, two of their biggest, biggest scores in that last cycle was Redback Mining and Lundin Mining, oh, three of them, and Lundin Petroleum. Uh, so they made a lot of money off the Lundin Group. David retired from Carmignac a number of years ago, uh, moved to London, and uh, he's, an in, he's an integral part of our, our board with his background in the, in the money markets. So, you know, we've, it's, a, it's a lean and mean board. We will be expanding that management team and board as we go forward into 2021 um, as a result of uh, Sudan basically coming off the last uh, sanction hurdle uh, for foreign investment, which is the U.S. list of state sponsors of terror. And Sudan is scheduled to come off that list on December the 11th this year. Yeah, that's absolutely excellent and really good news to see that happen. Appreciate it. Just a good team of staff, fantastic key people there at the company. Let's talk about, uh, and I'll come back to the, the U.S. Uh, sanctions here in a moment, Rick, but come back and highlight the uh, recent revised feasibility study that came out in September and also the permitting status of the project at this point. Okay. So as I said, in the fall of 2018, uh, we delivered a, a feasibility study to the government, and then we quickly went into a, a populist uprising in, in Sudan. And that populist uprising disrupted uh, our activities all the way through 2019. And we focused on maintaining the assets, securing the assets in Sudan, and in undertaking detailed engineering of the project. And that's and the detailed engineering. Uh, part post a feasibility study is a normal process. And so we've been carrying that on for over a year. And in September of this year, we did, delivered a revised study and based on the detailed engineering, and we were able to improve significantly operating costs, um, some capital costs, and came up with a much, much tighter uh, study on the project uh, in terms of uh, capital, and valuation. Uh, we also adjusted slightly the gold price we were using. The first study used a $1,250 gold for the economics, and this year we used $1,350. Still very, very conservative and way low compared to the market. But most, 
importantly, um, we, we stuck with $1,100 gold for the resource itself. And the reason we did, did that, we did look at during the detailed engineering part, changing the gold price for the resource itself. Um, but when we ran scenarios at 1200 or 1250 gold, we ran out of data. In other words, the model took all the drill holes. And what that showed us is that we need to go back. When we go back on the project uh, with a new exploration program, the first thing we're going to be doing is drilling the pits deeper. Uh, so we have more data so that we can adjust the resource based on a slightly higher gold price. So that's all pretty, pretty po very, very positive news. And that'll be, as I said, part of the um, resource definition uh, drill program that we'll be commencing in uh, Q1 next year. So bottom line, this is a project with staggering economics um, and, and we can get into it, but the reason it has those economics and when I get that, it, you can see from our presentation on our website, we put a sensitivity analysis in. And, you know, at 1350 gold, it's got an MPV of about $600 million at, in, in, in that range. If you get up to $1,900 gold, you're into 1.1, 1.2 billion and a, and a plus 60% internal rate of return uh, post-tax. So it's a spectacular project, and and the reason it is, and and the reason we're going to proceed and get this thing built, is that unlike a lot of big open pits today, uh, they're all very low grade, very low grade. Um, part of that reason again is there's, there hasn't been a lot of exploration done, and and we're, we're all we're doing is retreading a lot of old projects based on gold price. Block 14 is brand new, and what it what's key to it. It is at the core of the main deposit, which we call Galat Surface South or GSS, has 2 million ounces of two grams with a very, very low strip ratio. So how this is gonna be mined under the current plan is we are going to mine that high grade and stockpile the low grade. We will be mining that high grade for seven or eight years and it's gonna go through the mill at about 1.5 grams. That sounds, like a low grade, but for an open pit of this size, it's actually fantastic grade. And that's one of the reasons the NPV is so high. So what it also does is it reduces uh, financing risk. So if you're a lender and you see the payback period because of the gold price or the uh, the grade we're, we're gonna be processing, it, it is a very short window of risk for lenders. And I can tell you it at, our 1350 gold price, the payback's about two and a half, 2.8 years. At 1900, it's, it's, it's about a year, year and a half. So very fast economic return. That's what we like about it. And we think we're gonna have all sorts of financial flexibility going into the new year with Sudan coming off this sanction list. So that's the project, Andrew. Yeah, it's silly economics. It really is. Uh, it's typically triple the grade of, of what you're looking at for, for comparable projects. And even if you guys decided to go low grade at the current gold price, I mean, like you said, you're stockpiling the low grade ore, uh, obviously for future use. So it's really interesting in that sense. And of course, with the economics where you guys have said it, it's, it's robust even in a bear market the 321 US million capex is certainly reachable, uh, no problem, comparatively, no problem, given the group and so forth. So very, very attractive in that regard. Talk about the proximity of GSS and, and Wadi deposits. Uh, talk about the surrounding exploration targets, Rick, and yeah. how the topography of Block 14 area is really amenable to ore haul within roughly a 65 kilometer radius, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's, it's just a fantastic uh, geologic setting as well. Yeah, look, um, two things to touch upon uh, in terms of how I was talking about the feasibility study. I think everyone has to uh, keep in mind and appreciate, we stopped exploration um, a number of years ago. And the reason we stopped exploration is, you know, we felt we had enough information to design a mine. And any further exploration was was going to be uh, money very difficult to replace in the gold uh, environment and the market environment that existed at the time. On an exploration level, we have about 40 targets identified right now to go back in on the concession to go back in and do work on. Some of which have 
um, preliminary work. Some of them have a couple of drill holes in them uh, and with really great results. So we'll be going back in that. And, and remember the mine plan that we have, which is this mine the high grade for seven years and then, and then mine the stockpiles, that will only happen if we don't find any further higher grade material from our exploration program over the next few years. And that is very, very, it's very likely to happen. The odds are exceptional. So this mine is gonna produce for the first uh, six, seven years, 220,000 ounces plus a year. And, and we expect that at the end of that, it will still be producing that level going forward for you know, however long. This is a very prolific gold area and we expect to find lots of satellite targets. Um, on your point of 65 kilometers, we've actually drawn a circle of about 100 kilometers around the mine that we will be exploring in. The area is flat, it's desert. Um, the economics of trucking ore from as far away as 100 kilometers are, 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 are excellent, subject to grade. And, and that is the exploration sort of area that we'll be focusing on going forward over the, you know, the next four or five years at, at block 14. The other thing that's key, and so many people miss the significance of this, when you're working in an arid environment, a dry environment, you can find gold and you can go out and say to everybody, I've made a discovery, the numbers are great. Bottom line, it's not a mine unless you have water. Every single mine of any significance requires water and a lot of it. And block 14 is no exception. So we've spent a lot of time and money looking for water in the desert. <clears throat> And, you know, in the Nubian, Nubian desert, Sahara desert, you stand on the surface and you think you're, you're dreaming. But um, one of the things that we knew was that uh, historically, and we followed this up, is when uh, General Kitchener was coming down into Sudan, basically uh, to pay back the Sudanese for what they did to General Gordon, he was driving a rail line from Egypt through Sudan. And he got to an area of what, what is now called Station 6, and he ran out of infrastructure in terms of being able to deliver water. And they could not, would never have been able to um, drive that railway down into Khartoum unless they found water. And he sent out his engineers, um, and the history or the story is they used divining rods on camels, and they discovered water and dug a well, and there it was at station six. It was never developed to any significance other than providing water for the railway line and a little bit for local local consumption. We've come in, and big surprise, that is pretty much where we discovered a major, major aquifer with more than enough capacity um, to supply block 14. Uh, and any other number of mines that, that may be discovered in the area uh, in the future. It's, it's a significant discovery and in some ways just as important to Sudan as developing a gold business. So we're very pleased with that, very proud of it, and the Sudanese government recognizes the significance of that. And that segues into permitting. We have a huge permit over that aquifer. We have a thousand square kilometers permitted for exploration at GSA, at uh, Block 14. We're in the process of finalizing our mining lease over 38 square kilometers for our resources. We're fully permitted environmentally, uh, as I said, water and every other aspect. The feasibility study has been approved by the government. Bottom line is once we have secured the financing, uh, which we're looking to do in the new year, um, we will be able to immediately start serious, serious development of Block 14 with about a two to two and a half year build timeline. Yeah, it's very attractive. Uh, I continue to like it. And even though people shy away from Sudan, it's it's a fantastic uh, uh, proposition you guys have got set up and you have the water. And so far, the success there has been fantastic comparing to other deposits in the area in the district. Certainly uh, to the north, you have a challenger at Sukari, but maybe just speak to that for a moment. How important is, when when the time comes and the cash flow is coming, how important is the exploration and expansion potential here, Rick? And do you see the Block 14 really has a lot of runway left to add notable ounces? Okay, good question. Look, I, I, the best way to explain the potential is to describe what's there now. 
there are only two companies in Sudan that have done any serious modern exploration. Any other activity in Sudan is artisanal mining to one degree or another. The two companies are Managem, which is the Moroccan state mining company, and Orca, okay? Managem's a private company, so it's very difficult to tell, you know, what standards they've applied um, to their resources and, and their engineering. The Managem project is 100 kilometers to the south of Block 14 on the same structure, the same major structure. There is art, it's 100 kilometers. There is artisanal mining between our two projects for 60 of that 100 kilometers and five kilometers on either side of the 60. You go down to Managem's project, what we know in talking to them is their project is about the same size as ours, uh, similar grade. They don't have, I don't think they have the two million ounces of two grams, but they certainly have a large resource of about 1.5-ish. When you think that only two companies have done generative exploration and both companies within 100 kilometers have discovered major gold mines in a very, very small area. And again, between that 100 kilometers, there's 60 kilometers of workings of artisanal mining. Just on that basis, Andrew, the, the potential is, is huge in this area. And this is only one part of Sudan. There are mines or artisanal, significant artisanal mines all throughout Sudan. Sudan's basically endowment for gold is staggering. It's the source of pharaonic gold, the majority of the pharaonic gold of the, of the various the Egyptian empires. And it's now been newly discovered again by artisanal miners and us. There, every mining company in the world, gold mining company in the world is now very aware of Sudan. They're all following it. They're all watching politics. Uh, most of them, or pretty much all of them, do not have the political appetite that we do. But once things clear up, it's amazing who comes to call. And that's our experience uh, in just about everything we've done over the last 20, 25 years. Yeah, good points. And the appetite obviously has, has served you guys well. So with Sudan in process to be removed from the U.S. list of state sponsors of terrorism, talk about the efforts at the government and community level and about Sudan in general as a mining jurisdiction and really the impact now with what's forthcoming, the impact of availability and cost of capital to finance the project. The cost of capital question is the big question. That is going to depend on how people perceive what's going on politically right now in Sudan. Remember, this is, and, and also this has been a long process, okay? There's, there's been a whole number and series of sanctions on Sudan applied over the last 25 years. Most of those from the U.S. perspective were removed by President Obama before he left office in 2017. Under the Trump administration, the process of, of looking to get Sudan off the list and normalize Sudan from a political, political perspective has continued to this point. And we've seen huge strides, absolutely huge strides in Sudan. You've got to remember what, what we're looking at is a country for 25 years was effectively under a military rule. Not only was it a military rule, it was a fundamental religious rule, Islamic religious rule. The people had virtually no say in what happened uh, at the political level in Sudan. Obviously, there was no voting. The then President Bashir came to power by coup. Uh, he established a very, very strong military structure, and he led by effective intimidation and terror. And there's all sorts of things going on right now vis-a-vis -vis him and his principal cronies. Uh, he's in jail. He's been in jail now uh, since the revolution slash uprising. Um, he's likely to be tried in the International Criminal Court, as are some of his colleagues. Um, all his assets have been confiscated. And that's a process that's going on with Sudan, both in Sudan and around the world, trying to get back the money these people stole. But what's significant is this is a, a people that finally got tired of an autocratic regime, a military regime. And these very, very brave people took the risk that they were gonna get you know, killed and injured by a military government by standing up for themselves. Um, it was peaceful. 
it was very much Mahatma Gandhi-ish. Um, the people did not take up arms. They did not take up force. And as a result of that, at the end, okay, the military, the moderate military in Sudan supported the people in the end and effectively came out and removed the government. What they, what it, it's such a huge accomplishment. The people of Sudan um, have been penalized for 25 years for actions done by a dictatorial government. And we're seeing that in every aspect of terror accusations against Sudan, legal cases, everything. But again, I point out, and, and these all happen, don't get me wrong, there's gotta be some responsibility that is that is accepted by, by Sudan in general. But what the world now has to appreciate is this is a people that have thrown off the yoke of oppression and they're trying to embrace the world both economically and politically and religiously. So since the overthrow, the changes in Sudan policy, in society, in it's 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 staggering. We're now seeing women in, in every senior position. We are seeing freedom of religion. They've come out and made criminal, okay, the mutilation of women at puberty. They are welcoming uh, multi-dominational religious practice. This, for a lot of the people that go and build mines, is really important. They're allowing people that are non-Muslim to bring in alcohol and consume it in the country. That's huge. Um, and they're recognizing the rest of the world, in particular, look, let's face it, strong-armed at this point in time, but they're prepared to normalize relations with Israel, even though Trump's been defeated and that policy is likely not to be as pursued as aggressively against uh, countries like Sudan, I think that that process has started and in their own way, we'll see a strong normalization between Sudan and Israel going forward. These are huge things that is opening up this country and it's being rewarded. We've seen announcements of investment by General Electric. Apple has taken Sudan off the list of non-investment, uh, non-business. We're seeing Visa and MasterCard go in. We're seeing the international banks starting to recognize what's going on in Sudan and allow uh, people to have accounts that are somehow related to Sudan. Um, these changes are happening super fast, Andrew. They're going to continue into 2021. And, you know, it's going to be just a question. Look, lots of people, lots of banks in particular, I think we all know are very, very conservative. Uh, they're all waiting for the other guy to be the first one to make a major investment. But but it is going to happen, and you're going to see the floodgates open because Sudan, is the its resource potential is staggering, both from a, natural, from a mineral perspective, from an agricultural perspective, from, a, from an educated people perspective, from being on the Red Sea, having a major port, having an oil refinery, having railways. It, it, is a, it is a country that people do not know because it's been in, you know, in shadows for 20 years plus. But when now you go look at Sudan, it's a it's staggering uh, place to be with the potential to have one of the biggest economies in Africa. Sorry for that long diatribe, but it, it's a subject really close to my heart. A lot of solid points, and uh, certainly we'll we'll know that things are moving. As you said, there's some names that are coming in that have given the green light. And when you see McDonald's and Coca-Cola and, and Hershey show up, uh, you know you're on the right path. And you know the U.S. sanctions, sadly, sanctions, unfortunately, while they might impact the people that they're meant to impact, the collateral damage is is the people. And that's really a story that has repeated itself multiple times, Rick. We see other examples in that. I won't name the countries now, but we've seen at least, I can think of at least, well, at least two different examples that are currently ongoing in the world where the people of these particular nations have suffered only with the sanctions really meant to target 50 people, maybe maybe less, just a couple of dictators or a couple of people that are in the government level, but the people are affected. And so it's a dicey situation, and it's good to see that the progress there has really happened quickly. As you know, you guys have some ways and methods to uh, to finance the project, and, and that uh, 
maybe the big banks don't matter so much, but uh, you guys will find a way there. And it, it appears that that's getting even better with what's happened. Talk about just just briefly, uh, you know, share what you can here, but the financing package for Block 14. What are you targeting? Debt equity portion? Uh, are you looking at some type of offtake royalty or stream? And what does the timing look like? Uh, can you share a little bit of info on that front? I think this is going to be it's going to be a staged affair, and I'll tell you tell you why. Is I think people need to still get comfortable with Sudan. And could I finance this mine tomorrow? The answer is yes. Would it would it absolutely cripple Orca and its shareholders? Probably because of the current where we're trading currently. Um, and obviously, we're the biggest shareholders of Orca, and we're looking out to maximize value for ourselves and everybody else. So we won't be doing something that is destructively dilutive. We are going to likely uh, develop this project in stages, and we'll have announcements on that in the in the new year. Um, we've already been down. I've been down explaining what's going to happen to the Sudanese government, and we're going to show the world that we're progressing on this. That it's possible to do these things in Sudan. That it's impossible. It's possible to get also strategic investors that are prepared to see the value going forward and pay higher than it currently is today. Our stock price. Um, there's all sorts of different proposals that have floated around. We have resisted discussions of any, serious discussions on any of this until we see Sudan come off this list of state sponsors of terror. We want to give Orca and Block 14 and Sudan the most potential, the most optionality, and that'll be going into the new year. At the same time, as I said, we'll be announcing that we're going to be starting what you want to call pre-development, pre-major construction projects that, that need to be done at site, for example, um, to build an airstrip. This, this project's 14-hour drive from Khartoum, and you know, we need to have better access, faster access than that for all sorts of reasons going forward. So that's one of the things that's going to happen. Establishment of the construction camp is going to happen. The establishment of starting to, to drill the resource off and expiration again is going to happen. Um, and that's something that we can finance and fund easily um, into the new year. As people see, and you know, one of the things that everybody holds back, and let me let me tell you, everybody says, well, you guys aren't going to build it. You know, you guys are, you just guys are flippers. And I'm sort of going, I'm not sure which history you've seen or listened to vis-a-vis -vis us, um, but that is not what we do. Yes, we look at things, we go into, we go into projects, we go into investments, always thinking about the exit. How are we gonna exit? Because we're the biggest shareholders. We don't trade our stock. All we do is buy our stock, okay? We're, we're our biggest believers. And all the money I've made in the last 20 years of any significance has be, been because we've gone and said to everybody, you're wrong. If you're not going to pay us what this is worth, we'll build the mine and we'll go forward. And that's what we've done. And that's how we've been able to reward our shareholders the way we have, including ourselves. And nothing is going to be different about Block 14. Yep. Now it sounds uh, very compelling, and uh, we've been with the shares. Uh, boy, I want to say it's been since 2016, and have continued to accumulate where possible, and have not sold a share uh, since we came onto the story. Talk about just a bit about Montage for a moment, and the decision to spin those assets out of Orca versus maybe maybe the red back model of building out two projects in two jurisdictions. Maybe just talk about that and, and what the thought process was. Sure. Uh, the difference between Redback and, and Orca vis-a-vis -vis that was, was the perception of Sudan. Nobody had a problem um, with us being in, in Ghana. Everybody saw that as a westernized country and, you know, easy. What they didn't appreciate at the time was we were the first ones in over 10 years to build a mine in Ghana. And let me tell you, it wasn't easy. Um, I was amazed when we went to Mauritania. Uh, because of the success we'd had doing what we did in Ghana, people gave us much more of the benefit of the doubt than I expected, and we started getting some real value early um, in our share price for what we did in, in Mauritania. Sudan's different because overall, people were very skeptical about our political analysis of Sudan and that it could be, you know, in a reasonable time frame, a place that you could work. Consequently, we had these assets in Cote d'Ivoire, but didn't have any value for them in, in the Orca vehicle. 
And in fact, any discussions, corporate discussions we've had over the last few years, um, and everybody was trying to value those assets in CDI at zero. And we looked at each other and went, well, that's absolutely ridiculous. And these assets are amazing assets that we, dis we discovered when we ran Redback. And eventually we're able to break them out of, of Kinross into Montage, uh, as it is today. So what we decided as a, as a management team was, you know what, if the market won't give us the value of Montage or these assets in Cote d'Ivoire in Orca, and we're going to spin them out so that they're not tainted or they're not affected um, by a negative perception of Sudan. And that's why we did it. And we turned something that various corporates were trying to get for zero into over $100 million of value as a result of launching the IPO. And in terms of Orca's interest, Orca owns 33 million shares of Montage, and, and that's 35% of the stock. And we are the largest shareholder and the controlling shareholder of Montage. So when you look at or and, and Montage is, we firmly believe, Montage is on its way to announce another commercial operation that we'll be looking to fund and, and start construction on in 2022. So here's Orca sitting here with a, with a mine ready to build in Sudan, and now the largest shareholder, controlling shareholder of a company that's got a mine that we expect will get a positive decision on um, by the end of 2021. So there's a lot, we've been able to unlock that value. And as time goes on and we put out more news about montage and CDI and people get realize that things are going to happen seriously in Sudan, we think, you know, we are truly one of the strongest companies, uh, pre-development companies in Africa with two significant deposits. There's two things that I thought of when you were talking here. Talk about the uh, the decision, the trade-offs maybe, or, or the decision to retain the shares of Montage in Orca, rather being distributed to shareholders of Orca. And then also, are you of the belief that in the later, mid, late stages of the market, Rick, that more capital flows into these types of jurisdictions that wow. otherwise receive low valuations early on in a bull market. Do you see that that occurs? Uh, are you are you a believer? I, I've seen some other people talk about that. Are you a believer that that does occur, that, that capital you know, may start out with producers in safer jurisdictions, but eventually as the bull market starts to move into the later stages that that capital recycles and comes into these other jurisdictions that where the perception has changed? Andrew, look, I, the question it has, you know, there's a double aspect to that question in the sense that, yes, I think capital is going to flow into these jurisdictions, into these companies as the gold price continues to go up and, you know, people are looking for a gold equity investment. Um, there, it's going to, you, you know, and we've seen windows of that where junior explorers have been able to fund in, in 2020, which hasn't happened for five years previously. So it is, it does happen. However, where the money is really going to flow is where people see, you know, a reasonable shot at, of a jurisdiction being able to um, host a project that can go into development and construction. And that project is world class. What everybody's going to start focusing on is where are the world class projects? You know, where can we find a project that's going to produce plus 200,000 ounces at a, at, a, at a low, the lowest quartile cost base? Okay. That type of analysis is, I think, going to be front and center, followed by, you know, then you go down the food chain. And eventually, though, it's got to be people have got to fund junior explorers to fund projects like Block 14, because otherwise we're gonna run out of them pretty quick. So that's one of your questions. The other question is about the montage shares. Look, let's put it this way. If a corporate came in and gave us an offer we could not refuse, and it was the right thing to do for our shareholders, we would likely um, look hard at spinning out the montage shares. However, if we're gonna build a mine and, and we have to continue proving up the political stability of Sudan and the prospectivity of, of Block 14, and we have to show the world that we're going to go ahead, then that, that interest in montage is a significant asset. As well, if we're doing that, then we're going to be looking to build Orca 
again further. Where's the next project we're going to get? Yes, we're going to find more projects in Sudan. We will definitely be doing that. But if you know, Hugh Stewart and the guys are successful in finding and proving up another significant deposit in CDI. Work is in the pole position to do something with that project for our shareholders. And we are going to maintain that optionality um, until we can come up with the best deal uh, for the shareholders of Worka. Good answer. I agree with the thought process here and at the stage that you guys are in with needing to finance and get this thing off the ground and get it into cash flow, which is obviously a big deal. Rick, you continue to have an appetite for difficult jurisdictions that can take a lot of extra years and extraordinary efforts to deliver on. If Orca gets taken out by a mid-tier major, are you staying in the business? And if so, what are your next plans? Look, I I love what I do. You know, I'm 63 years old next month, and it's time, I think, for the younger generations to come up and, and take more responsibility and, and more leadership in, in our business. Um, I'm there to assist. I'm there to fund. Um, I certainly don't have the financial resources of my friends Lucas and, and Ross, but I'm not insignificant, and I'm looking to back uh, strong teams and strong people. And certainly, um, you know, in, in the group, in the management group of Orca and Montage, I'm the oldest. And so these guys have a bunch of years left that I will continue uh, to support at a board level, at an advisory level, at everything. And I'm, I'm going to continue to be a major investor. I can tell you, Orca, in terms of me being the guy in charge and making it all happen, as I look at it right now, um, Orca will be the last one I do, uh, and after that, I'm in. I'll be in a serious support role. But as I said, it's time for time for the younger guys to take it on. And 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 you should everybody should watch closely the Lundin boys. In this respect, they are very much getting involved in the Lundin world and Lundin business in management and in um, uh, certainly in in ideas and growth concepts. And and quite frankly, there's others. Um, around. I mean, we all, all the senior guys, all the senior people in the Lundin group that made the Lundin group, both both mining and oil and gas, you know, we all have children. We all have people that are keen in our circles to basically maintain the dream and keep it going. So I'll be, I'll be there behind that as well, Andrew. Well, good. No, I'd like to see you and Hugh, I'd say, keep it rolling and 63 happy birthday early uh you're you're still pretty young rick so we're all good <laughs> I love it. Uh, well at current price levels market cap around 145 million canadian why now should potential investors be considering orca at this stage for the company and in this current gold market condition what would you say to potential investors who are listening and also even existing shareholders looking to add to their position Look, the reason people should be investing now is, is the country of Sudan is virtually de-risked politically, and we're going to see that in December. Um, that has been the major ceiling on the Orca stock price. And with that coming on, people are going to then say, well, let's, have a, let's think about that asset they got. Wow, that's amazing. And when you look at that asset at, in a place that you can actually build a mine quickly, then you know, as I said, it really is a no-brainer. That's why we're in it. That's why we keep participating and we're the big players in all our financings. You know, we're believers and this, this thing's going to get built. It's going to get built quickly and it's going to be a major story in our business going forward. As Redback was, it's, a, it's sort of like, quite frankly, this is how you do it. And if you do it right, the rewards are significant we're poised to start realizing those rewards pretty quickly. So it's a question of, don't get me wrong, if you're in for, you're, if you're a day trader, you know, certainly some people have been make, made money day trading Orca, but that's not what we do. I haven't sold a single share. Lucas hasn't sold a share. Ross hasn't sold a share. We are looking for the brass ring, in this case, the gold ring at the end of the day. And we've made our shareholders lots and lots and lots of money who have followed the same business plan that we do and believed in us. So all I can do is tell you that, that I'm going out with a great swan song with Orca and I invite everybody along for the ride. 
very compelling. And Rick, uh, best way for investors to reach out to the company? Look, the best way is through the website and contact um, investor relations. You're, we're going to be making some, as I said, expanding our uh, corporate development team and um, uh, IR efforts going into the new year with Sudan coming off the list. Um, we'll put it, be putting out some announcements on that. But um, I would, as I said, go to the website and uh, there's lots of numbers, to contact stuff there and away we go. I would just say it's orcagold.com. O-R-C-A gold.com. And Rick, it's been great to chat and thanks for taking the extensive amount of time here to talk Orca Gold. Keep up the progress. We're happy to be along for the ride and uh, take care and we'll chat again soon. Thanks, Andrew. And thanks for uh, putting up with my uh, long-winded answers to your questions.